Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is August 27, 2012, and my guest is Neil Borofsky, former Special Inspector General for the TARP program and author of Bailout, his memoir of that experience. Neil, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you for having me. Uh, let's start with TARP, uh, which uh, I always think of as standing for Toxic Asset Relief Program, but it's actually the T is actually Troubled Asset Relief Program. It was originally proposed – by the Bush administration as a way to purchase so-called toxic or troubled assets from banks to reduce the risk of some kind of financial meltdown. So give us a brief history of TARP and how SIGTARP, the special inspector general, got involved and how you got involved. So, so TARP came about in, in the fall of 2008 when really the wheels were falling off of the financial system and the largest banks, the largest financial institutions were suffering these enormous losses, largely because of their exposure to certain real estate-related assets, bonds and CDOs, the sort of complex bonds of bonds um, that were all tied to the American real estate market. And as the real estate bubble popped, those, val- those assets, those troubled assets, lost value, creating massive losses for the banks. And the original idea of TARP, as it was sold to Congress, um, as Secretary, then Secretary of the Treasury Hank Paulson and Chairman of the Fed Ben Bernanke went to Congress, was that they wanted to get authorization to go out and borrow $700 billion um, in order to buy up from the banks these troubled assets, or to, as, as we called them at the time, toxic assets. So that was the original pitch to Congress, that, that these losses were causing such havoc in the financial system that absent some extraordinary bailout of taking these toxic assets off of the bank's books, um, we would be heading towards another Great Depression. Um, of course, what happened soon after and really – during the, the whole time period, while they were pitching this to Congress, they realized that the original plan of buying toxic assets just wasn't going to work, and that instead they were going to have to um, um, actually put money directly into the banks through purchase of uh, preferred shares of stocks, and, and ultimately that's what, um, what they did after they got the authorization. So that's sort of where TARP came from. I think TARP was sort of a little notice provision that got put into that bill where Congress um, essentially insisted that there be an oversight mechanism. And as I talk about in the book, Treasury and the White House wasn't too thrilled about it, and they really fought against it. Uh, but, but a couple of senators, really on the Senate Finance Committee, insisted that there be a new agency created to provide oversight of this sort of remarkable expenditure of government money. Um, so they created the Special Inspector General for TARP, or SIGTARP, and our role was, was as Congress designed it, was, was twofold. One, we were going to be a brand-new law enforcement agency, a sort of mini FBI for the TARP that would go out and police and deter and try to lock up anyone who tried to steal from the program. And second is an oversight function to have reports to Congress, to to Treasury, to the American people, to to the press, um, reporting what was going on and to investigate and audit the activities of Treasury and the participants in this program, the idea to to eliminate waste, fraud, and abuse. So that's sort of how how the bill ultimately came to pass. Now, I think it's important to mention, as it's easy to forget, but the original TARP plan was, I think, three pages uh, that uh, Secretary Paulson thought would be enough to get Congress to get him uh, authority to spend $700 billion uh, because the world was coming to an end, he said, uh, any minute. Uh, It didn't. Uh, It took, I think, uh, two weeks uh, since Congress turned it down. Rejected that. Uh, it was voted down. And then two weeks later, TARP was passed. And as you point out, in that in the intermediate time and also I think in, in the implementation period, that original design of buying up assets was rejected. It may never have been the idea. We, we have no real way of knowing, I don't think. But the other point that you make in the book that's important, I think, for, for listeners to understand is that you did not get on the job until half the money was out the door. Is that correct? That's right. We didn't. So, pass, TARP ultimately got passed and signed into law on October third, two thousand and eight. Um, I ultimately didn't get confirmed by the Senate until December eighth, 
and started the job on December 15, 2008. And during that period of time, hundreds of billions of TARP dollars were committed, um, and a good chunk of it went out the door before we got there. And unfortunately, without a special inspector general within the Treasury Department looking out for the taxpayer, looking out for potential areas where the money could potentially be gamed by, by the banks or, or be vulnerable to fraud or abuse, uh, there really was no, that voice really wasn't there. And partially, I think, as a result of that, the money went out with almost no strings attached, with no mechanisms tied to what we were told was the policy goal, which was, of course, that the money wasn't just going to be go into the banks and, and help them avoid failure, but the idea was that it was going to, the banks would then put it back into the economy to try to um, improve lending and restore credit, uh, do something about the incredible credit crunch that had, was really um, crushing the country at that time, um, but, and also very, very few protections against fraud. Um, you know, it just the money just went out, and I think part of it was a result of there was no internal watchdog voicing the, the taxpayer's interest at this time. Now, I hate to suggest that I'm more cynical than you are. Uh, you you talk at the beginning of the book about your your past as a prosecutor uh, in a prosecution prosecutor's office. Uh, g- give us thirty seconds of that, and let, then I'll tell you why I mentioned my cynicism. What did you do before um, this? So yeah, so I spent eight years as a, as an assistant United States attorney here in Manhattan, in the Southern District of New York, uh, where I sort of started off as a narcotics prosecutor. Um, was down in Colombia a lot, doing going after some of the big drug cartels, uh, and then latter part of my career, I was doing securities fraud. Uh, I prosecuted the principals at Refco for a, a multi-billion-dollar accounting fraud for that commodities giant. So, um, and then eventually, early in 2008, I started up a mortgage fraud group, which was targeting those who were taking advantage during the run-up of the financial crisis um, of, of sort of the lax underwriting standards and a lot of things that made the crisis possible. Um, and our job was to, to find them, lock them up, and prosecute those who, who, were, who were ripping off the system. So given that past, I, again, I hate to sound more cynical than, than you are because you, you have had a lot of life experiences that I haven't had, particularly those vacation trips to Colombia, I'm sure were, uh, were really uh, delightful. But I, I have to say that when, when TARP passed, uh, I, I have a simpler view of, um, of government, which is when, when it – whatever it does, that, that's sort of the purpose. Uh, and so what I saw TARP doing is – helping banks get money, and the professed goal of the program, which was to increase lending, uh, never struck me as a, as a plausible one. In fact, early on in the TARP program, and you talk about this in the book a little bit uh, and, and more about other aspects of it. Early on in the TARP program, I remember Secretary Paulson being greatly disappointed that banks weren't doing more with the money and weren't lending, and I thought, well – he didn't give any incentive. He just gave them a lot of money. Uh, and if they're worried about the future or their books are not very good, uh, it's not surprising to me they're not lending. But you spent a lot of you spent a lot of time as the special inspector general and talking about it in the book that that you thought that this was actually the purpose of the of the of the uh, of the legislation. And uh, there were people who actually pretended that it was correct. Yeah, I think that's that's an important point of, of understanding what my job was. Um, so part of the, the role of SIGTARP as Congress created us was to be, and, and this really goes for any inspector general, for any massive government program, was to be on the lookout of what the stated intentions were of the program. And, and here, you know, it's not incidental. I'm, as, as, as we all recall, uh, TARP was not a tremendously popular bill at the time, and, and it failed the first time when it went through the House. Um, and it seems like in the aftermath, many political careers were destroyed by it uh, in, when they came time for re-election in 2010. But one of the things that, that Congress insisted upon, because they didn't want to vote for something that was just going to be purely a bailout for the banks, um, was these other goals, these other conditions. Um, even more than lending was, was helping to preserve home ownership yeah. and to do something about the raging foreclosure crisis. And ultimately, Treasury justified its use of the money in the way that it did by buying preferred shares of stocks of the banks to prevent them from collapsing, essentially, justified it under the idea that it, the banks were then going to take it and use it to increase lending. So part of our job was to, was to track that policy goal and point out the failures that Treasury had in trying to accomplish that goal. And as you said, one of the failures was a complete absence of conditions, requirements, or even incentives, some carrots that you know to offer the banks to try to get them to deploy that money back into the financial system 
Um, and the other part of that, was, which we spent a lot of time, was to try to bring more transparency on the idea that, that we should know as American people and Treasury should want to know, as the people running this program, what it was precisely the banks were u- using the TARP money for. Um, and we ran into a real brick wall for Treasury in, in the form of Treasury of just refusing to have the banks report on that. And our idea of doing that is, was one general goal of good government and transparency, but second, it would help Treasury measure implementation against this goal, which was supposedly to get the money back into the system. And I, but I think you're right. I think one of the reasons why they fought us so hard on, on, on this sort of very basic requirement of getting the banks to say, hey, this is how we're using TARP funds, is that they didn't want a public record of where it was going because they kind of knew that that was never really the intent. And as we later found out, as we started doing our audit function, our investigative function, they, at the time that the TARP money was going out, even though Ben Bernanke and, and Hank Paulson were issuing press releases saying how healthy and viable the banks were and that they would use this to, to deploy the capital into the system, that privately they confessed to us that they had real doubts about the survival of several of these banks. Bernanke uh, mentioned that Goldman Sachs was soon to go, and uh, Paulson thought that Morgan Stanley would have been the next one to go absent TARP. Well, so, you know, the, the less cynical part of me says that you know, they desperately needed to – prop up these banks to keep a meltdown from occurring, and this was the politically attractive way to do it. You pretended it was to encourage lending and credit. Really, What it really did was to salvage the, the, uh, the books of the banks in ways that would keep them afloat. The cynical part of me comes back, though, and says, well, how do you know Goldman Sachs was next? I mean, that, who told you that? Well, Goldman Sachs, I'm sure. A, a lot of banks, I'm sure, told the Fed and, and other – and people at Treasury, how perilous these times were. Uh, there's an event you don't mention in the book that I think about way too often, which is the – I think it was 24 phone calls between Hank Paulson and Lloyd Blankfein, the head of Goldman Sachs, uh, the week before the AIG – or two weeks before the AIG bailout. And we don't know what they talked about, but um, I don't think it was their kid's summer vacation. I think it was why this was crucial for the future of, of mankind – I don't think it was a uh, you know a conspiratorial. I hope it wasn't a conspiratorial, corrupt thing where Blankfein said, "Hey, we're we're going to lose fifteen billion dollars if AIG goes under. We're, we're expecting fifteen billion. I assume he explained how desperately Western civilization needed this to to happen. No, and I think you, you strike on one of the major themes of the book, which is this is part of the problem that existed then and continues to exist today is that because of this revolving door between Washington and Wall Street, um, you have a government in the Treasury Department and the, the federal regulators like the Federal Reserve that is so captured by the interest of Wall Street, so familiar with those interests, that when you're in a crisis or when you're crafting legislation or you're designing a bailout program, as I saw time and time again, you go to those people for advice and guidance and your information. And not surprisingly, when they provide you that advice and guidance, um, it is mostly in the interest of those Wall Street banks, not necessarily in the interest of the taxpayer or the general Main Street or the rest of the country that's supposed to be benefiting. So I think that there's a lot of asymmetrical information flow that comes from Wall Street into Washington. And because of where these people come from and also who they surround themselves with, this, these arguments take on more weight than they should otherwise should or would. And, you know, I saw that over and over again in the bailout. As these programs were designed and implemented, and as I fought for types of that, I thought really basic common sense protections and transparency, like how, do you, how are they using the TARP money, they would just call up, get the arguments, and recycle and regurgitate them to, to me or to members of Congress. And, and so you have this identification at the highest levels of power in Washington, you know, with the Lloyd Blankfeins and the Jamie Dimons uh, and the various CEOs, uh, because those are the people that they rely on, and those are the people that they trust more than anyone else as, as knowing what the right thing to do is. So, so I think you're absolutely right, actually, and, and that, that cynicism is well-founded. So although I truly believe that Ben Bernanke and, and Hank Paulson and Timothy Geithner, who was then president of the New York Fed, truly 100% believed that they had to do exactly what they did, lest it be the, the end of civilization, a lot of that information was coming from the institutions and executives who benefited the most from it. And I like to remind my listeners that 
many economists agreed with them, and but I think they also have a have a conflict of interest as well because economists benefit from the a powerful Fed and a powerful Treasury, and I think um, as economists we should be speaking out against these uh, claims and asking for evidence rather than saying yes, yes, it was it was absolutely necessary. Now, to be fair to the other side for a minute, not too long though, don't worry, Neil. Uh, okay. But to be fa- fair to the other side, uh, one of the one of the complaints that you received constantly, one of the arguments you received constantly when you demanded uh, some kind of accountability of what was being done with, with the money was the response uh, that money is fungible. Uh, we can't say what we did with this dollar. It's not even really meaningful. And how did you try to answer that claim, which is a legitimate claim often? You know, if, if, if I give my um, – if I give my kid twenty dollars and I say I want you to spend this twenty dollars on, on, on uh, history books and not on comic books, uh, ultimately what I've done in standard view in economics is I've given him more purchasing power and he's going to buy more of everything perhaps and he'll just say oh was, yeah those were the dollars that went to the history books and the, the comic books I didn't use your money for that so what was your response to those kind of arguments? Well, I mean, first of all, was to accept the fact that money is indeed fungible um, and. You know that that is sort of one of these 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 tautological statements that that is true, but our point was that that didn't necessarily mean that you couldn't have some meaningful measures. Um, and not being an economist myself, I, I went to to one or two as well as talked to some accounting friends. Um, I did have experience doing money laundering investigations where where tracking money was very much part of the job. And you know the counterexample I would use that I remember saying to Neil Kashkari, who was running TARP at the time, and I think later to, to Tim Geithner himself, who was then Secretary of the Treasury, was that you know I was sort of in a situation where I came into a little bit of money, say say five thousand dollars, a uh, a bonus that I that I had received, and you know it's true when that money went directly deposited into my checking account, it got commingled with the rest of my money. Um, but what I did is I used that five thousand dollars and paid off my student loan. Um, so if you did it before and after snapshot of my personal finances before I got that money and after I got that money, you could pretty much trace that that money went for that intended purpose. And then if you were to ask me and say, hey, what did you do with that money? Did you have any specific plans for it? I could say, well, yeah, actually I got it and I used it in that way. So we tried to build a model around that sort of basic common sense idea of of snapshots. Um, What were your positions afterwards? Um, what did you do? First, you asked the banks what they were going to do with it, and then you, you measured the difference. So what happened to lending levels before and after? What happened to acquisitions? We know a lot of the banks told us that they used it to acquire other banks. Um, others told us that they used it to pay down lines of credit that they had from other financial institutions that pulled the money out from under them. So what we try to do is, is, is accept the fact that you were never going to be able to perfectly trace every single dollar. Um, but you could get a good snapshot so you get the general use. And we also found out once we asked ourselves that these questions, that some banks actually did try to track dollar for dollar what they did with the funds, including some of the big banks. So it, it was a, a challenge and it wasn't necessarily easy, but the interest of good government, the interest of providing that level of transparency, we think made it possible. But one of the interesting things was, as I repeated these arguments over and over again, um, I never really got a fair listen. Uh, it was, I was told that I was stupid. I was told that I didn't understand anything, that I was being political, that I was grandstanding. Um, and ultimately, you know, it was never a real discussion so much as it was a repetition of the line that they had obviously been fed by the banks, that it's just not a possible thing and there was no interest in doing it. Well, I like the argument uh, that says that if you require the banks to re- make, say, a report, that could be a flawed report. It, you know, I... I accept the issue uh, of your critics that it's hard to do. I, I don't think it's impossible. I accept the, the argument of the critics that it's imperfect, but you'd learn something. I think that's the that's the main point. Uh, if you had forced the banks t- to report on what they did with the money, even maybe even they'd lie. Okay, they'd lie, and maybe the before snapshot would be distorted or the after snapshot. But you'd learn something. Uh, but but one of the arguments you kept getting was, oh, that that'll cause banks not to participate. And talk yeah, about this that. Is, this is this was not just for this piece, but almost any time that we 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 identified a, a conflict of interest in one of the TARP programs or a vulnerability to fraud, and we said you know it was important to close this loophole or bring this level of transparency. Um, and even later, when it was just enforcing Treasury's uh, 
contracts with some of the big banks in the mortgage program, mortgage modification program, we would keep getting that same response. Well, the banks will just walk away. The banks won't participate. And, you know, with respect to this, I mean, my response was a pretty simple one, is that if you have a bank that is so frightened by a little bit of transparency that they'd rather not participate than disclose this information, um, wouldn't, that, wouldn't we be better off with that bank not participating in yeah. TARP? I mean, do we really want a bank that is so unwilling to basic transparency not to at least make the effort to report on what they, what they did with the money? I mean, it was sort of a – but it was always reflexive. And I always attribute it to the fact that they would go out and talk to a couple of banks and say, what do you think about this? And the banks would always say, well, if you did this, we would walk away from the program. And you know, they, they specifically told us later on that that was the responses from some of the financial institutions. Um, and Treasury was never really willing to push back on that. And, and instead, they sort of went with this, you're going to destroy TARP, you're going to destroy the banking system, as I was later told, um, when I decided that I needed to go out and do my own audit and try to bring some level of, of, of transparency to the system. Well, while we're talking about transparency, let's talk about one issue that really I think is was, you know, I filed this in the paper in, in real time, obviously, and um, it was – it's quite entertaining to read about it in the book, and and I, sh- I should add the book is is a really um, engaging uh, tell all about uh, what life in Washington is like, alongside the details of uh, of the bailouts. But one of the things that you talk that you achieved, and I think that the book uh, talks about nicely, is the gap between the public pronouncements uh, of how successful these programs have been versus the reality. So. We have many. I'm sure many people have heard that the auto bailout paid for itself. It's a. It's our. The government's broken even. The TARP. We we made almost all the money back. There's a few small banks that haven't paid back, and uh, some of these statements might be true. Some are not true. W- why is there a gap between uh, these public statements, which should be checkable and transparent as can be? It's it was our money. Why is it that some of the government statements about these amounts are not accurate? The program became more and more politicized during my my time there. If you can if you can believe that, yeah. as politicized as it was when it first started, but over time I started seeing Treasury's announcements started becoming um, more and more deceptive. A lot of half truths, a lot of sort of very thinly slicing things, so that they would be literally true, but really when looked in a broader context uh, were potentially misleading. So, for example, you know we'll hear a lot about how. They, they made money on the banks, and they would give a number by slicing a few of the TAR programs. Um, but it's not always clear whether they're including, like, Ally Financial, which is a giant bank for which Treasury is going to lose a lot of money. But the, but the response would be, well, no, that's in the auto program because that was formerly GMAC, so that doesn't really count. Uh, or they would ignore the bailout of AIG, um, which you know, was really done to save the banks by paying them out huge amounts of money on money that AIG owed them and otherwise wouldn't have been able to pay. But they say, well, that wasn't really a program about the banks. Or they'll change their accounting methods, which is something that they did with AIG to make it look like the losses, potential losses, were going to be a lot less than they ultimately turned out to be. And, you know, in in 2010, shortly before the midterm elections, uh, Treasury put out this document and Secretary Geithner wrote an op-ed and they hit all the cable TV shows uh, talking about how the numbers had gotten so much better for AIG, but didn't disclose that that was mostly the change in accounting methodology. Um, and the really, the, the, there's so many things that are, are, are bad about this um, for what it does to how Americans perceive their government um, and how we perceive the, the Treasury Department, which is now with almost zero trust, as, as the polls indicate. But it was also so entirely unnecessary because in, in this area of of potential losses from TARP, it is one of the few areas of success when you compare to where we thought we were going to be back in 2008 and where we were in 2010 and 2011 today. You know, the losses are far, far less. I think the total most recent estimate is around 60 to $70 billion that Treasury estimates will be lost from TARP, which is a lot of money. But compared to the $350 billion that we anticipated back then, um, you know, this, is, this is good news. But by, there's this need in Washington um, just over and over again from the White House, from the political arms of Treasury, to make something that's good and make it look great, even though it ne- isn't necessarily the true. And that's just part of Washington. I think lying is so embedded in the culture there that when you say something that's literally true, people really begin to believe that it's the absolute truth – 
and that anyone who criticizes it uh, is out of their mind or a partisan hack or, or has some other malevolent motives, which was ultimately what was ascribed to me as I started pointing out these sort of half-truths and, and potentially deceptive statements that they were making. Which is a little ironic because, as, as you point out in the book, uh, you're a lifelong Democrat. You were appointed by a Republican president, but part of the reason you were appointed is because you were credible. And, and ultimately, I found out much later because I was a Democrat in part, too, because that, they thought that maybe that was the one way to get me through um, the, the Democrat controlled Senate, you know, in the waning days of the Bush administration. But, you know, I, I contributed to President Obama's campaign uh, back in 2008 as Democrat all my life. Uh, but it was somewhat funny when they started spreading rumors in the press and, and leaking information that I was one time I was called a closet Republican, which I thought was funny. Um, a Grassley Republican, or named after Senator Grassley. I'm not sure what that means. And, and even that I was, I was planning on switching parties, and I was going to become a Republican and run in 2010 to be New York State Attorney General as a Republican. I mean, but, and, you know, I would hear these things. I would hear them from the press. would say, oh, Treasury is telling me this. And it, it just, you know, the, the, that type of lying and that type of character assault um, is just so typical in Washington. But that's sort of how it works. I, I actually think that for a lot of these folks, they just don't understand um, people coming at, at and, and making these types of criticisms just because it's a, your job to do so. So it's almost like they have to believe that there's some partisan or political motivation behind it, uh, as opposed, God forbid, of just trying to do your job. Yeah, it's a form of witchcraft. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a belief that there's these secret forces at work that, that are casting spells on otherwise good people and you – know. Um, let, let's talk briefly about two programs that we've never talked about explicitly on this show that it would be nice to get a little bit of education for me and, and the listeners, which are TALF and HAMP. We won't get into PPIP. You talk about that in the book as well. But TALF and HAMP were uh, large-scale programs or at least hoped to be. Um, what were they and how did they work and how did they fail when they failed? Well, well, TALF was, I I'm would only, say... Is, I wish we had three or four hours for this, but we're going to have to <laughs> take five well, minutes. TALF was sort of a moderately successful program. Um, it was originally intended to sort of restart one of those markets that had been destroyed in the financial crisis. And that was, those were bonds that were backed by consumer loans. Um, so car loans, right? Car, yeah, car loans, student loans, those types of things. And, you know, when the, when the bottom fell out on the... Other asset-backed securities, the mortgage-backed securities, which record those toxic assets that are at the heart of the crisis, um, all those other uh, loan-backed bonds, uh, those markets all disappeared as well. Um, and they, like the, the bigger mortgage-backed market, has turned so much on credit rating agencies. And the credit rating agencies, which, of course, assigned their opinion, their letter grade to bonds based on their opinion as to whether or not they're going to default or not, were so thoroughly discredited that you had this that that it went beyond just the mortgage backed securities but went into all these other things as well and since a large amount of of consumer debt in this country comes from these bonds uh, and investors who buy these bonds and enable so many of these auto loans and and student loans and and others, the idea was to bring that market back um, and originally it was it was imagined to be a two hundred billion to ultimately at one point, a trillion dollar program. Um, ultimately, I think the number came in in, in the 70s. Um, but one of the sort of striking things in the book was that as I was first getting up to speed, and I realized that, that Treasury and the Fed, and this was a program that was run by Treasury and the New York Federal Reserve, um, that they had, no, um, they had no fraud protections in there. There was really no concern about fraud. There was no compliance program. And when I was pressing them, I eventually got a meeting with Bill Dudley, who, of course, now is the president of the New York Fed. I think at the time he was the acting, uh, acting president. And I was on a phone conference with him, and I, I asked him, I said, well, what are the protections going to be for the taxpayer? Because you know, this program, the way it was originally designed, was just so vulnerable to abuse. Yeah, talk about that. T talk about how a little bit of the details of how it was going to work. So the way it was going to work was that a private investor would put up um, a small amount, let's say, you know, 5% of the purchase price and to, to buy one of these bonds. And the federal government through the, through the Federal Reserve was going to provide the, the balance, about 95%. But it was going to be in a loan that was they call a non-recourse loan, which meant that 
that the, the borrower never actually had to pay it back so that they could um, essentially walk away if the value of the bond decreased more than 5%, they, wouldn't, you know, they could just walk away and the taxpayer would be on the hook. And TARP money was going to backstop those potential losses. So that created a lot of opportunity for, for mayhem, in our view. Um, you could have collusion between the bond seller and the bond buyer, uh, a, a kickback scheme, or you could just have you know, really sloppy underwriting because the, the, the investor incentives. You know, has, a, very, very, has you know, a lot of upside but a very limited downside. Um, so that, that, that's what we saw, and that's why we pressed, well, how are we going to protect the taxpayer? And, you know, and ultimately, what Dudley told us, that they were going to rely on investors' smartness and, once again, the credit rating agencies. And you know, my reaction at the time was, was one of shock, that here we just had a financial crisis that proved that credit rating agencies were not to be trusted, and that investor due diligence, even when they're on the hook for all of the money, um, isn't really, can't really be trusted. And now the Federal Reserve and the Treasury were going to recreate that system, only put a giant government guarantee behind it. And when I asked him how you could possibly trust the rating agencies, his response was very telling. He, he told me that um, he didn't think that the rating agencies would ever, quote unquote, embarrass themselves again, um, and that they were going to bet $200 billion of taxpayer money uh, on the rating agencies suddenly becoming very competent at their jobs because they were not afraid they wouldn't want to embarrass themselves. And, and I thought that, that really captured a lot of the capture of Washington and, and of our regulatory system, that they were willing to recreate this very same broken system. Um, and you know, in that same conversation, he refused to have any type of compliance regime in, in place. Um, and you know, that was sort of shocking to me. Fortunately, we were able to go to Congress, go to the Senate, and get enough pressure put on the Fed that they ultimately did make it a much safer program. And how active was that program? Do you know? I think it's about $70 billion went out. And, and I think thanks in large part to the protections we were able to get them to uh, adopt. Uh, I think it's a program where the taxpayer won't lose any money um, and may even actually have a little bit of profit from the interest that they charge. But like you, as you point out in the book, my view always was, well, why would we want to re recreate something that just <laughs> almost destroyed our country? Uh, you know, the whole idea that we have to get back to the status quo, even if the status quo is horrifying, uh, is is horrifying to me. And I, the, the other point I want to make, which I think is really important, is that you know, reputation plays a very important role in uh, in in free markets. Uh, it, it's a very powerful, I think, incentive to to for prudence and, and diligence and uh, honest dealing. But it doesn't work when you have uh, a government monopoly. It doesn't work when you take out the costs or greatly subsidize the costs of losses. So the ratings agencies, they're not really free market organizations. They're government uh, – I was going to say created. They're not government created, but their power is government created because of requirements that government – uh, if you issue bonds and if people are going to buy your bonds, that they be rated by these two or three, I think. I think there's three that are allowed to do it. And they did a horrible job. And in a normal world, they'd be gone. Can you imagine if, if, if a clothing company sold you clothes that fell apart or poisoned you or gave you cancer and they did it for years and then they said, well, we won't do that again. We don't want to be embarrassed. You'd go buy somewhere else. But right now, there's not such an easy place to go buy somewhere else because of the way this has been structured. It's uh, – I, I really believe – I don't think anybody was, was very fooled by it. I think they were – I think most investors, not all of them, of course, but most investors understood that, that they were compromised, as you point out in the, in the book. I think many people understand that. They profited from these – from the ratings they gave. It was obviously a crummy system, and the fact that it persisted tells you it's not a very good – it's not – there's something unnatural about it. And, and the sort of the remarkable thing is that the whole reason why there was a TALF program – was because the market said, yeah. we're not going to trust the rating <laughs> yeah, agencies exactly. anymore. So we build this program which just puts the government in a position of, for massive losses, and the one thing that gives them comfort is that, well, we will trust the eight rating agencies. Yeah, exactly. Um, but your argument is correct, and it's the same thing applies to the largest banks. Um, and, and, you know, I kept hearing that same reputational risk defense um, in other programs um, with other types of, of anti-fraud measures that – that I didn't need to worry because the banks would never risk their reputation by putting profit over the public interest. Um, and, and this very Greenspanian concept 
that reputational risk is all we need instead of fraud controls, it just doesn't work when banks are being supported implicitly and explicitly by the government because yeah. that changes it. If you know you're not going to fail, the rep, your reputation becomes a little bit less important to you um, when you have an opportunity to maximize profit in ways that go up to the line and often cross over it. And let's now turn briefly to HAMP. Uh, talk about what HAMP uh, was supposed to do and uh, why it didn't work very well. So HAMP is the Home Affordable Modification Program. And when TARP was passed, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, um, there were a lot of Democrats, particularly in the House, who were not keen on voting for a bank bailout of Wall Street. And their pound of flesh, what they demanded be put into the bill, was foreclosure relief. Because in a lot of their districts, by two, October 2008, the foreclosure crisis was raging and really destroying whole neighborhoods. So what they extracted from Treasury was a promise the TARP wouldn't just be used to help the banks, but also homeowners. And they even built provisions into the legislation that said that once the Treasury was doing what it supposedly said it was going to do, which was buy mortgage-related assets, and once Treasury owned $700 billion essentially worth of mortgages, the Treasury would then have to do a modification scheme to make these mortgages more affordable, You know, whether it's through reducing principal or, or doing interest rate modifications. And that was sort of what they did in order to, 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 to get these, the Democrats, a lot of these Democrats, to vote for the bill, without which the bill never passes. Well, of course, they leave the original toxic acid purchasing idea, and we come to January 2009, after Obama has been elected, and Larry Summers, who's coming in to the new administration, is trying to get Congress to release the second half, the second $350 billion of TARP funds. And Barney Frank and a lot of, again, House Democrats, once bitten, twice shy, say, no, we're not going to do this unless you commit to putting up at least 50 to $100 billion to help homeowners. And that's where HAMP was born, in a letter that Larry Summers sent before Obama even took, took power, um, promising that there would be this program. Now, the program that was launched, and the president said that it would help up to 4 million homeowners stay in their homes, uh, unfortunately, it was just a disaster. It was remarkably poorly put together. It trusted the bank's servicing arms to carry out the program on behalf of the Treasury Department um, and was riddled with conflicts of interest that often gave the banks the incentives um, to actually string homeowners along, rack up a lot of fees, and then pull the rug out from under them, throw them into a foreclosure scrap heap, um, and that under this incentive-based program, would actually be more profitable for the banks in some instances to do that than actually modify the mortgage on a permanent basis in the interest of the homeowner. So as to why Treasury did this, I think it was partly because of just disastrous planning, uh, but part of it also what the true intent of the program was. And, and I talk about in the book how in, in late 09, when it was becoming more and more obvious that this program was never going to come anywhere close to meeting its goal of helping 4 million people permanently stay in their home. Uh, today, it's about 20% of that number. Um, we were at a meeting where Secretary Geithner was confronted about how is this program ever going to meet its goals of helping homeowners. Uh, and his defense was very telling. He, he explained that Treasury believed that the banks could handle a certain number of foreclosures. I think he said it was about $10 million, uh, over a certain period of time. But anything more than that could threaten the solvency of the banks. And in other words, we could be back to plugging more capital holes in the banks because of the foreclosure crisis. And that he saw HAMP as a way to, and the exact words he used was, foam the runway for the banks. In other words, to extend out the foreclosure crisis um, so that all those foreclosures wouldn't hit all at once and give the banks an opportunity, as another Treasury official told me, to earn their way out of it, to help repair their so-called fortress balance sheets, take advantage of the other TARP programs, of the other, you know, zero interest rates, uh, present interest rates, and all the other federal programs to support the big banks um, so they could get through that. And once we heard that, and once you understand that, you sort of, the failures of HAMP start to make more sense of why they had these terrible conflicts of interest baked into the program, and even after we pointed them out to Treasury, they stayed in there. Um, why, when the banks just abused homeowners in this program, um, just, you know, absolutely trounced all over their rights under the contracts, why Treasury refused time and time again to hold the banks accountable and, and have them actually 
uh, and either punish them or require them to adhere to the terms of their contracts, it, it all starts to make sense that this program, just like all the rest of TARP, wasn't really about helping the homeowners as it was, in Geithner's words, to foam the runway for the banks. So that's why I think the program failed from a homeowner perspective, but was probably successful for Geithner's ultimate goal, which was, again, to help um, extend things out for the, for the benefit of, of the banks. And while we're talking about Geithner, I want to talk about uh, his role in the AIG um, uh, bailout, which you correctly point out, as I always like to do, that it wasn't so much a bailout of AIG as a bailout of its creditors, uh, people that had promised uh, to uh, insure on their um, various uh, financial instruments. Uh, you give the figure, I think, of 14 point something billion for Goldman Sachs. Um, that's number two. Society Generale of France, the French bank was number one. I can't remember the figures, higher, quite a bit higher. So these are the people who benefited from the AIG um, rescue, uh, not so much AIG, but of course the executives at AIG, they, they benefited. They got the controversial uh, bonuses that they were promised. Um, an alternative, as you point out, would have been to let them go bankrupt, let AIG go bankrupt and negotiate with its creditors to take what's called a haircut, to say, well, we owe you $14 billion. We don't have $14 billion. You only get 8 or 4 or whatever it would turn out to be. Uh, why didn't that happen? And how did, you get, he, how did you get involved in that ex post? Because you were not on the job at that time. There was no SIGTARP. Right. So this is part of our audit function because, you know, ultimately – TARP ended up backstopping about $70 billion of TARP money went, in, went into AIG as part of the more than $180 billion bailout, as you said, of the company, but more importantly, of its, of its counterparties and creditors. And you sort of have to remember that almost every one of the bailouts, it's, it's partly about the institution and their executives, um, but it's more so for the people who that bank or institution owes money to. Um, and, and those are sort of the, the you know, the, and, and whether it's, it's what's going on right now in the European government's Yep, same uh, and, thing. You know, that's really a bailout of the European banks that lend money to those governments. It's almost always about the creditors, and those creditors are almost always about the large to big to fail banks. Um, but we got involved. We got asked by Congress to do a review of the decision that was made by Geithner to, when he was still president of the New York Fed, to pay the banks, as you said, a hundred cents on the dollar for what were essentially a bunch of toxic assets. It was sixty something billion dollars of toxic assets that uh, AIG had insured. Um, and ultimately, the government bought those bonds uh, from the banks and can't, ripped up the, the, the insurance contracts at you know, 100 cents on the dollar for a bunch of bonds that were really worth less than half of that amount and which would never have gotten paid but for the government bailout because AIG just didn't have the money. It's why AIG ultimately had to get bailed out is because they didn't have enough money on hand to make the necessary payments under those agreements. And you know, ultimately, Treasury didn't – I mean, New York Fed and Treasury – didn't actually have to put AIG in bankruptcy. Um, they could have just used their leverage Correct. Um, to try to negotiate uh, those types of haircuts. So it wasn't 100 cents on the dollar. And when we started digging around and doing our report, we found that they actually did make some minimal effort because it was even apparent to them that this was such an unfair and unjust result that the taxpayers bail out AIG and Goldman Sachs and Bank of America and, and the French banks are all getting this incredible windfall for on what them was not recognizing the counterparty risk when they, they unloaded so much of their own risk onto AIG through these, these, these credit default swap insurance contracts. Um, but of course, what followed was this incredibly lame effort um, to negotiate, as, as we, we discovered and reported. Um, you, know, you, you have a great contrast between how when the government understands that it wants, has leverage and uses it um, such as when the original money went to the TARP banks, or we're even going back to the bailout of LTCM um, more than a decade ago. You know, there is government understanding leverage and getting a result, but none of that was here. None of the CEOs were called. Geithner himself didn't get involved in the negotiations. He had mid-level guys at the Fed call up mid-level folks at the banks and saying, hey, do you want to take a haircut? You don't have to, but if you want to, that would be great. And the bank said, no. And actually, one of the banks even said, yes. Um, yeah, that's, yes. yeah, that's, I, I love this. Tell that this is one of my favorite, uh, it's, it's black comedy, but go ahead. So we do this audit and this audit is going on for a course of six months and we're told time and time again, I even am talking to the general counsel of the New York fed, um, that none of the banks were willing to negotiate. 
Um, and then really right on the eve of our report, as we do our sort of final review, um, someone at the Fed raises their hand and says, oh, yeah, uh, UBS actually offered to take very much 2% haircut, uh, but still a haircut. And by the way, didn't we tell you that? Like, well, no, in fact, they hadn't told us that. Um, and we later found out that wasn't the only information that they hadn't told us. Um, and when we went back and looked at it, 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 UBS made this offer, but the Fed did nothing with it. Um, part of the offer they said was that UBS said that, well, gee, others might need to also take this similar haircut for us willing to do it. Uh, but the and they all refused. Nothing. And they all refused, strangely enough. <laughs> it's, without but, being... but, the war, but the problem is that Fed didn't even go back to the other thing and say, by the way, UBS is willing to do this. Won't you do this? The Fed didn't go to UBS and say, look, enough with them. Why don't we take your 2%? They just walked away. They just, just said, oh, okay, thanks, and moved on and just paid everything out. And there really was this remarkable lack of effort. And I think as somebody from, once told me from inside the New York Fed, it, it was almost as if they were just... Um, felt like they couldn't be embarrassed enough, that it was almost demeaning to the Fed for them to go out and try to actually negotiate haircuts. Um, and there was, there was no effort into it, and as a result, you know, all that money got paid out, and you have another windfall for banks who, again, under a normal functioning market, free market, get punished for that counterparty yep. risk from putting such big bets on with AIG, which they had to have known that AIG would never be able to, to pay off if, if, if we had a housing crisis. But again, the whole presumption of bailout is so underlies our market that we don't have a free market. We have a government-subsidized market that encourages inefficiency um, and encourages really unfair and unjust results. And when actions are taken, like Geithner did with AIG, it just reinforces all of that unfairness and inefficiency in our markets. Yeah, to, uh, I'll read the quote from page 181, uh, paragraph. It says, in that respect – Geithner's opening of the spigot of taxpayer cash for AIG was more of a bailout of the banks than it was for AIG itself. The government thereby sent Wall Street a very dangerous message. Counterparties who do business with financial institutions whose collapse could have devastating consequences for the entire financial system needn't do due diligence or worry about their counterparty risk. Instead, they can rely on the government to bail them out. So and for me, the – the tragicomic part of this is the two percent offer. It's like out of guilt. Yeah, I, I, this is really a. Uh, I don't know. If, I don't know why it reminds me of it. But in the Robert Caro biography of Lyndon Johnson, in the second volume, he details in great uh, detail the uh, voter fraud that the Johnson campaign perpetrated to defeat um, to win the Senate uh, election. And one of the the form the fraud took at one point. There were many forms of it, but one of it was that. I think hundreds of people voted uh, who were not registered, and they voted – these extra votes that came in late were in alphabetical order. Uh, they didn't even bother to, to, <laughs> to not – to take – to make it look random. They, they were in alpha people just strangely enough, a few hundred people or dozens, I can't remember the number, just showed up just by chance in alphabetical order, <laughs> and except for one. One of them was out of order, and I always view that was the, you know, the cheater's way of saying, you know – I, oh, no, no. It's, it couldn't be uh, deliberate. Look, they're not in alphabetical order. One of them. <laughs> so you offer a haircut. There had been negotiations prior to the government stepping in where there were serious haircuts being proposed and, and Goldman and others were negotiating with AIG. And when the government comes in, it's like, oh, well, I'm done now. Now I don't have to negotiate. And so UBS offers 2%. I mean, one, one would be like, just a total slap in the face. Two is like, well, I didn't offer one. <laughs> I just find it – it's it incredible. Was, it, it was the banker's equivalent of giving the valet, when they pick up your car, a $5 bill. Yeah, And exactly. what Geithner did and the New York Fed did and the government did was say, no, we don't want your money. So, um, and, it, and look, it, it is tragic. It is comic. Um, but those dangers that were impregnated in the system – we're still living with today, and we still operate under a system with these too big to fail banks and these dangers who learned very carefully. Markets watched and learned the lessons from 2008, um, and by having not solved that problem, um, we still have those inefficiencies and distortions and the absence of market discipline, which is going to set us up for another fall. Yeah, I agree, obviously. Um, now, you tried to get Tim Geithner to justify those decisions. Uh, and I'm going to ask you two questions, neither of which is, is particularly pleasant to, to answer. Uh, one is, uh, what, how successful were you? And the second is, 
he's kind of the villain of your book. Uh, there are a few, but he, he's one of them, maybe the big one. Uh, what do you think he'd say if he were um, – what do you think he will say when he writes his memoir? Oh, uh, that's actually a good question. I can't imagine it'll be remarkably complimentary. You know, he did say after the book came out, he was interviewed on on Charlie Rose and mentioned how deeply offended he was by uh, by the suggestions in my book. Or actually, he said suggestions. I I didn't suggest yeah. it. I actually stated it. Yeah. Uh, that he put the interests of the big banks over that of of of, of Main Street um, and of the other the taxpayers and small businesses and all the other people he was supposed to serve as, as Treasury Secretary. Um, so I'm sure we'll, we'll see some of that, you know, and ultimately on the, on the AIG issue, and we saw this a lot on basically uh, indefensible positions is that they don't answer the question. It, it's, it's duck and weave it, you know, we, we had to do it this way. Um, if, if, if we hadn't bailed out the paid a hundred cents on the dollars, the financial system would have collapsed and, uh, we had no leverage at that point, and it would have been inappropriate for us to use any leverage that we had. Um, but one answer, question he never answered um, was, why didn't he at least try harder, um, use some of the same mechanisms that they had used previously, getting the CEOs together and really putting the pressure on them personally? Um, he's, I never was able to get a, an answer from him on, on that ultimate question. And that's because there really is no answer. Uh, yeah. You can't answer a question for which there is no answer. Uh, or at least no satisfying answer. And I strongly suspect that when he writes his, his, his memoir, um, he will also not ask, answer that question, but instead talk about how deeply offended he was. Now, one of the puzzles of, of his tenure, and I could be wrong about this, so correct me if you know otherwise, um, he is not part of the revolving door in a literal sense. I think he has never worked on Wall Street. He has hired many people who did. He was put in treasury by – I think into the New York Fed, excuse me, I think by Wall Street, uh, meaning the, the help of Wall Street people who recommended him. But as far as I know, he is not part of the revolving door in a literal way. Is that correct? Absolutely correct. I think he worked for, for Kissinger's consulting firm for a very brief period of time. But he's not – and in the way we traditionally think of, of the revolving door, certainly, certainly not. Um, but it's important to remember that the, the type of capture, the type of regulatory capture – often happens for people who've not yet worked on Wall Street. Um, and in, in Tim Geithner's case, you know, he worked for a thoroughly captured institution, the New York Fed, you know, where his board members, yeah, uh, as disgusting. president, his board members were Jamie Dimon and, and CEOs of, of big commercial banks in the yeah. New York district. Um, and his peer group and the people that he relies on for advice when he was there, and then when he came to Treasury Department, was he surrounded himself with Wall Street um, refugees. You know, people, his closest counselors were people like, like Lee Sachs, who was from, you know, as Bear Stearns, and then later was one of the architects, was really oversaw the creation of some of the most toxic CDOs when he was at Mariner before coming back and working for Geithner. Um, you know, the, the, the people running the TARP all came from Merrill Lynch, Bear Stearns, Goldman Sachs. So this, he surrounded himself and all of his key advisors, the people he was relying on on forming policy all came from within this echo chamber. And there was no diversity whatsoever at Treasury when it came to the bailouts, um, you know, other than perhaps Secretary Geithner. But again, he was such a creature of that system from where he became. And if you look at, you know, talking about phone records, you know, Tim Geithner, I probably had two meetings with him one-on-one -on -one during my two plus years with him, one of them which lasted 30 seconds. The other one, he screamed obscenities at me for, for 45 minutes. Um, when you compare that to the number of times he had telephone conversations with Lloyd Blankfein or other CEOs, I mean, it gives you a sense of where he's seeking advice, where he's receiving his advice. You know, one of the things I often joke about is Elizabeth Warren, uh, who was the head of the Congressional Oversight Panel, who I dealt with a lot when I was doing my own oversight. You know, I always think, about, what if you had someone like that, instead of providing oversight of the bailouts, actually inside that bubble, working on the housing program? Um, you know, some sort of diversity of, of voice, a consumer advocate, a housing advocate, um, but it wasn't. And that makes it very easy, of course, to discount those views, to, to rule them out as being stupid or politically motivated, which is what Geithner and his team did to any dissenting voices. And, you know, when you maintain this type of echo chamber. And the second part, of course, is, you know, one of the part aspects of the revolving door is that there's a huge incentive for people within the government uh, to get those jobs on Wall Street. And, and shaping what they do. And I was told point blank by um, Assistant Secretary of the Treasury that 
I was harming my own interest in getting one of those jobs one day by my tone, by my harshness and my criticisms of Wall Street and, and the government, and that I needed to change my tone. Uh, and so there's, a, there's also still that, that promise of reward um, if you do the right by Wall Street. You know, I think it was interesting in Ron Susskind's book, he quotes the Wall Street CEOs as saying that Tim Geithner, they refer to him as our man in Washington. Um, and, you know, there's an eventual payout for, for that type of role as well, I imagine. Well, uh, Mr. Orsog had a very lucrative uh, post-Washington job uh, working, I think, for Citi. I'm not for sure Citi. I get that oh, right. They, and if you look at it, it's sort of – it's not just Citi. It's Goldman Sachs. I mean, so many of the people that I had seen a doubt with uh, when I was down to Washington have now landed in, in one giant investment house that benefited from TARP or one other giant bank that, invented, that, that uh, also benefited from TARP. It's really almost across the board. So how can we, um, other than educating ourselves, listening to Econ Talk and reading Bailout, all of which are good things, of course, um, how can we do something about this? Uh, I, I like outrage. I mean I think um, being incensed uh, about this aspect of the treasury is a good thing, and I think people did pay a political price for failing to uh, – or for being complicit in it. Some politicians did, but – it doesn't seem we've made a lot of progress. Uh, what are your thoughts on how we might get a better relationship between Wall Street and the government? I think there's a few things that we need to do. Um, first of all, I think we need to choke off. You've got to go to the corrupting influence itself. Uh, and to me, that means truly ending too big to fail uh, and the promise of, of future bailouts by, by breaking up the banks. Um, if you break up their power and influence, um, you can start doing chipping away of some of this wholesale capture of the regulatory system. If there's less power um, that, that comes with these implicit guarantees and, and sort of the perverting sense and all that lobbying money and all the, the dangling of those jobs, um, that, that will help. I think we need to do something on the regulatory side to change the incentives of regulators. So, you know, I was told point blank that I was ruining my career uh, by being harsh. I think a lot of other regulators aren't told that explicitly. But it's still built into the system yep. that if they pull their punches, there's a big cash out, uh, whereas if they do their jobs aggressively, they may actually get punished. So I think we need to change the incentive structure on the regulatory side. And the third thing we have to do is stop voting for people um, who are going to affirm the status quo. And when every time we reelect someone who, who, who refuses to sort of take on these issues, uh, whether it's a position on, on too big to fail the banks or, or, or a broken regulatory system – we, with our votes, we reaffirm the status quo, and so if I, I think that's that's part of it as well. And if I, uh, if I can just make a mildly depressing observation, it seems unlikely that this issue, which I feel is the central issue, uh, other than the size of government, the central issue facing our country is this relationship and the potential for future damage caused by past bailouts and recent bailouts. Uh, it doesn't seem to be on the radar screen of the political. Uh, campaign and it seems unlikely to be, and that just um, it, we might have to wait a little while. But uh, I, w I think that's true. But you do start hearing hints um, uh, from very unlikely sources. Uh, Romney the other day uh, in a campaign speech talked about how Obama's made the big biggest banks bigger. Uh, uh -huh. Ryan has flirted with the idea of a, of a glass steagle in some of his speeches, and, and I agree with you. I think the money and power is too important. Yeah. Too much of it flows into the into the campaigns. Yeah. Um, but the fact that they're even talking about it gives me some slight slender read of hope that probably not in 2012, but maybe 2016 or even maybe hopefully 2014 yeah. that, that we can get a movement going. Yeah, it could be. Um, there's some hope. Uh, I want to close with a question about a, a personal question. Uh, you went through an extraordinary experience. Your book captures some of it. Obviously, it's it's imperfect in terms of how much it it captures because it's you know it's not a long book. Uh, it could have been eight hundred pages. Uh, I think it's two hundred and thirty something of text, two hundred and thirty four. Uh, so th that recommends it to the to the average reader. And if you read it, you'll learn a lot about uh, the bailouts and TARP and all that, which uh, is useful. But you'll also learn a lot about Washington. And I'm curious what you learned about Washington. Uh, you don't reflect on it much in the book. It's kind of obvious uh, that it, you got hit upside the head a few times and, you know, shocked, jarred and beaten uh, by the, the nature of Washington. But I'm curious what your reaction was and if it changed your view of government in any way. 
It it certainly did. Um, I I didn't realize how how captured the interest uh, captured by the interests of Wall Street Washington was, um, and how how often it it does not serve the American people as it does to the people who are funding the town through campaign contributions and 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 and, and through lobbying. And I mean that that seems like a pretty obvious thing that most people know and understand. Uh, but it was a I was a real. I think I was a true believer in 2008 of of, of President Obama, and I really believed that everything would be different, um, and that this was that he was an agent of change, and that he would bring the type of meaningful change that to our government that that we so desperately needed. And what I saw firsthand was, and perhaps the thing I learned the most was just how little difference there was between the Republican administration yeah. and the Democratic administration. Uh, it's not that one was better or worse than the other. It's just they were remarkably the same, the same exact arguments. Um, I think the tricks were a little dirtier with the Obama administration, but I don't think that's attributable to the pol- political party. I think it was just that they had more time and more time <laughs> yeah, with, they get better at it. with the Republicans. Well, they get better at it. They had to, they had to hone time, their exactly. skills. So, but I think that was the thing I learned the most is that it's not, you know, when, when, you, when you fall into these campaign ads and, and sort of believe that one side or the other is, is fighting for your interest. The reality is you, ca- you can't listen to what they say. You got to listen to what they do. And what they do is, is, you know, there's remarkably little difference when it comes to these types of core issues that have become most important to me. So it's kind of a depressing thing. Um, but I also did see on the optimistic side that there are, there are people out there who care. There are some good civil servants and there's members of Congress who really sacrificed their relationship with the White House in order to go to bat for us and try to give us the power to, to protect the taxpayer, even when they were undoubtedly getting calls from the White House, chewing them out for being supportive of, of me and our agency. So I do think there are some glimmers of hope in that most hopeless of all institutions, Congress. Um, and, and that's why I say, like, look, you know, we don't, there isn't really a presidential candidate to vote for who's going to do the types of real meaningful reform to our financial system. Uh, but there are members of Congress and people running for Congress who will. And to me, that's a good place to start. My guest today has been Neil Borofsky. Neil, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.